This program is rated PG. It contains themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. We're working to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. I'm Alma Angeles and you're watching ASEAN in Focus. Joining me today is from the beautiful island of uh, Maldives, beautiful island nation of Maldives. Hello, Steffi. Hi, Alma, and I am Steffi Dihuan, bringing you the news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. The Philippines has been deploying military aircraft to monitor the situation of the Julian Felipe Reef in the West Philippine Sea following sightings of Chinese militia boats in the area, according to Defense Secretary Delphine Lorenzana. A fire from a hurled Molotov cocktail broke out early Friday at the party headquarters of the post civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar's largest city, a party official said. All Vietnam Airlines employees would be vaccinated against COVID-19 for free. That according to a representative of the national carrier. Yeah. Around 1,500 medical workers and COVID-19 patients, many in full PPEs, join for a mass performance of the Ang Klung, a traditional Indonesian instrument made of bamboo. And now to the news. The Philippines has been deploying military aircraft to monitor the situation of the Julian Felipe Reef in the West Philippine Sea following sightings of Chinese militia boats in the area that according to the Secretary of Defense, Delphine Lorenzana, he said observing from the air is easier, quicker, and more accurate. Armed Forces of the Philippines Chief of Staff, General Cirilito Sobejana, on Thursday said more naval vessels are deployed to bolster maritime sovereignty patrols of the West Philippine Sea. And this came as the National Task Force for the West Philippine Sea, or NTFWPS, expressed concern about a Philippine Coast Guard report that around 220 Chinese fishing vessels, believed to be manned by Chinese maritime militia personnel, were sighted in line formation at the Julian Felipe Reef on March 7. The European Union and New Zealand were the latest to join calls to reserve to preserve a rules-based order in the South China Sea following the reported lingering presence of the vessels in the area. Japan, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and the U.S. also expressed concern over actions that may raise tensions in the disputed waters. China, however, maintained that these vessels are only seeking shelter in the area. The reef is a large boomerang-shaped shallow coral reef at the northeast of Pagkakaisa Banks and Reefs or Union Reefs located approximately 175 nautical miles west of Bateraza, Palawan. The European Union, or EU, and New Zealand joined calls to preserve a rules-based order in the South China Sea amid the reporter lingering presence of Chinese, Chinese fishing vessels at the Julian Felipe Reef last Tuesday. EU Ambassador to Manila, Luke Berun, on Thursday said the bloc stands by rules-based order as he stressed the need for all parties to adhere to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. He also cited the statement made by High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy Joseph Borrell at the recent EU Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN ministering meeting. 
we cannot allow countries to unit uni unilaterally Lottery undermine international law and maritime security in the South China Sea, thereby representing a serious threat to the peaceful development of the region, Borrell said. United New Zealand, meanwhile, urged parties to exercise self-restraint resolution of disputes by peaceful means and undertaking cooperative activities to build trust and confidence while it echoed calls for unclosed adherence. The New Zealand statement was delivered during the 28th New Zealand ASEAN Dialogue last March 23, where Manila reiterated its objection over the continued provocative presence of Chinese fishing vessel at the Julian Pelipperi. Meanwhile, here's Chinese Ambassador Wang Xilian's comment on the DFA's demand for China to pull out its fishing vessels in the Spratlys, particularly the Julian Felipe Reef. Let's listen in. As we issue a statement the day before yesterday, Chinese fishing vessels have been fishing in the area for many, many years. Now those vessels are taking shelter in the part of the, you know, that uh, sea. I think it's a quite normal activity. There is no such militia vessel as claims by some people. Any speculation is not help. Thank you. Meanwhile, Chinese ambassador to the Philippines, Wang Xilian, has also assured President Duterte that the Philippines need not worry over the reported presence of Chinese vessels in Julian, Filipino Reef or Union Reefs, according to Malacanang. Ambassador Wang gave the assurance when he paid a social call on President Duterte at Malacanang in Manila according to presidential spokesperson Harry Roque in an online press briefing. Ambassador Wang, Roque said, echoed China's stance. That the spotted Chinese boats off the Julian Felipe Reef in the WPS were merely taking shelter due to rough sea conditions. First, let's go to Myanmar uh, and an appeals from rights expert, UN Special Rapporteur Tom Andrews, for greater international pressure to resolve the deepening crisis there. That has allowed the military coup on February 1. That has followed the military coup on February 1. Conditions are deteriorating, Mr. Andrews said on Thursday, warning that the situation will likely get much worse without an immediate robust response and support of those under siege. To date, more than 120 people have been killed by security forces, according to UN independent rights experts. And the UN Human Rights Office has condemned the soaring death toll. Mr. Andrews underlined the in ineffectiveness of sanctions, which have left the most lucrative business assets of the junta unscathed. In a call to UN member states, including those in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN, the European Union, the United States and China, the Special Rapporteur urged them to hold an emergency summit to provide a focused a diplomatic solution to the crisis. Ex-civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi was due to have a court hearing on Wednesday in Myanmar's capital, Naypyidaw, on criminal charges that could see her permanently barred from political office. But her lawyer, Kim Mangzo, said the hearing was adjourned until April 1 because of problems with video conferencing caused by a junta-imposed internet shutdown. According to some defects in uh, internet and Wi-Fi uh, apparatus, uh, the video conferencing cannot, could not be done. So the case 
was adjourned, the hearing was adjourned to the 1st of April, the April Fool's Day. So we want uh, that adjournment will be the act of April Fool's or not. So that is uh, the government forming day. But now the leaders of the winning party are now facing charges and most of them were on uh, the, the trial. The biggest difficulty is, uh, I'm, I'm serious and I, I'm doubtful that those, not only the Aung San Suu Kyi and not only the president, but all those tried in the present can have fair trials, rights, and uh, the rights of the defendants that is already allotted by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, uh, by any civilized constitution and any civilized law. In a country, in Evidence Act, the statement or the saying or the confession of a person under arrest and under the in the detention of the authorities or the police cannot be presented as evidence to any court. So that is not admissible, inadmissible evidence if she was charged in any court. The confession of Pyomin Lane and Mount Wake cannot be used as evidence against her. So we have declared and we have made statements and we have applied to the court that uh, this trial should not be done in video conferencing. Suu Kyi faces several criminal charges, including for owning unlicensed walkie-talkies and violating coronavirus restrictions by staging a campaign event last year. She is also being investigated for corruption allegations. Her lawyer says he has still not been able to speak to her privately. The junta alleges the detained chief minister of Yangon confessed to giving Suu Kyi 600,000 US dollars in cash along with more than 11 kilograms or 680,000 US dollar worth of gold. The Nobel laureate, who is widely beloved across the country, has not been publicly seen since she was detained. A massive fire has ravaged the world's largest refugee settlement home to nearly 900,000 Rohingya refugees and has taken at least 15 lives. The UN Refugee Agency, in support of the ongoing response led by the Bangladeshi authorities and in coordination with UN organizations and NGO partners as well as refugee volunteers, is rushing to provide critical support and protection to some 45,000 Rohingya refugees who lost their shelters and belongings in the devastating blaze. Take a look. We are deeply concerned about the fire incident that took place in some camps uh, near Cox Bazaar. Families were separated. Some children are still looking for their parents. This is a very, very difficult situation and our heart goes out to the thousands of refugees who have yet met another disaster. The Rohingya refugees who lost everything in a massive campfire in southern Bangladesh need the world's support more than ever. That is the message from the UN's emergency relief chief, Mark Lokak, who's released $14 million from a central fund to support thousands of families at Kutupalong camp in southern Bangladesh. The cause of the fire is still unknown 
as is the exact number of casualties at the camp. UN Children's Fund spokesperson James Elder told UN News shortly after the blaze was brought under control. In a statement on Thursday, Mr. Lowcock described the refugees who fled what top UN officials have likened to ethnic cleansing in Myanmar in 2017 as one of the world's most vulnerable communities. They need our support now more than ever as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to take its toll and with the approaching months and season, the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator explained. Impormasyong mahalaga sa taong bayan. Patas na pagbabalita. Papakinggan ang magkabilang panig. Lilinawin ang mga isyu at kaagad na ihahatid ng objektibo. Mata ng Agila. Dumadagit ng pinakasariwang pangyayari. Hindi lamang sa loob ng bansa, kundi sa iba't ibang panig ng daigdig. Mula sa Eagle News Teams at sa tulong ng makabagong teknolohiya, tiyak na makakalap ka agad ang katotohanan. Para sa mas matalas, malinaw at malalimang pagbabalita, ito ang mas pinatalas na mata ng agila. Inihahatid ng veteranong broadcast journalist na si Eli Saludar. Kasama si Pinipining Pilipinas Intercontinental 2019, Emma Tiglao. At pinangungunahan ng batikang mamamahayag ng bansa, Vic De Leon Lima. Mata ng Agila, lunes hanggang biyemes, alas 6 hanggang alas 8 ng gabi, dito sa Net25. Almost 400 detained illegal migrants found to have contracted COVID-19 at an Immigration Bureau detention facility in northwestern Bangkok have been transferred to a field hospital converted from a police sports stadium. The 393 Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodian immigrants who illegally crossed into Thailand were first found to have contracted the virus back on March 18, sending fears throughout Thailand that the group would become the new cluster that could start another wave of outbreak in the kingdom that is still recovering from the pandemic and the government's delayed inoculation plans. A Singaporean blogger was ordered Wednesday to pay almost 100,000 U.S. dollars in damages for defaming the Prime Minister by sharing an article on Facebook linking the leader to a corruption scandal. Prime Minister Lee Shen Lung had accused Long Si Yan of spreading false claims about him over the article related to the money laundering scandal at state fund 1MDB in Malaysia. Critics says the case is the latest example of the tightly regulate, regulated city, states government being heavy-handed and seeking to silence dissent online. Singapore's leaders have, have frequently turned to the courts to take on critics ranging from political opponents to foreign media outlets and insist such actions is necessary to protect their reputations. 
High Court Judge Edith Abdullah found in Lee's favor and ordered you to pay him 133,000 US dollars, Singaporean US dollar, or 99,000 USD. Lee had sought 150,000 Singaporean US dollar. The Premier took the stand at the start of the trial in October and accused Liu of making malicious and baseless allegations which had undermined the government's integrity and honesty. The article that Liu shared originally published in a Malaysian news portal alleged that Lee was the target of an investigation in neighboring Malaysia over the one MDB state fund. Billions of dollars were looted from the investment vehicles in a scandal that involved Malaysia's former leader, Najib Razak, and his inner circle. Long's lawyer, him, had argued the libel suit was unnecessary as authorities had already denied the allegations, adding the Prime Minister had pitched on the defendant while there are many others who had shared the defamatory article. In other news, Egypt's blocked Suez Canal will inevitably cause a knock-on cost effect on consumer goods, according to author Rose George, who sailed the Suez on a container ship while researching her book about the shipping industry, 90% of everything. Take a look. It's, it's an absolutely essential part of our modern life, and this webcam would not have reached me without modern shipping and this computer and pretty much everything on my desk because uh, shipping still brings us 90% of everything and I think in the UK it's 95% of everything and we are absolutely fundamentally reliant. It's, all very, it's already pretty cheap to ship a t-shirt or anything depending on how the industry is doing and the price of containers. I know that they have risen considerably in the last year th uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, but it's inevitable there's going to be some knock-on cost effects. I do wonder, I mean, I know that the official reason so far has been given as being a gust of wind and that the container ship was had the boxes um, piled so high that it kind of served as a sail and pushed it into the side of the canal. I don't know if that's true, but I do know that more than two thirds of marine accidents are due to human error. So I do wonder what will come out. As you can see here, this giant container ship, almost as long as New York's Empire State Building, is high, got stuck during a sandstorm Tuesday in Egypt's Suez Canal, causing a traffic jam of cargo ships through one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. The vessel's manager, Singapore-based, Bernhard Schultz Ship Management said the 25 crew aboard were unhurt and the hull and cargo undamaged. The Suez Canal Authority, or SCA, says the accident was mainly due to the lack of visibility due to the weather conditions when winds reached 40 knots, which affected the control of the ship. The megaship blocks the shipping artery through which more than 10% of global maritime trade passes, and much of it is oil and grains. And as a result of the accident, more than 100 vessels are now forced to wait at either end of the canal or midway at Egypt's Great Bitter Lake, says canal service provider Let Agencies. The blockage of the global trade choke point hits world oil markets as traders anticipate delays in deliveries. Crude futures surge 6% on Wednesday. The waterway drastically shortens travel between Asia and Europe because it prevents vessels from having to navigate around southern Africa's Cape of Good Hope. The Singapore to Rotterdam route, or route, for example, is 6,000 kilometers and up to two weeks shorter than having to go around Africa. Okay, let's go back to the uh, pandemic situation this time in Thailand, where the government is expected to give the green light to allow tourists who have been vaccinated against the coronavirus to visit the beautiful island of Phuket. Take a look. 
Now, when they visit there, uh, they won't have to have to undergo the mandated quarantine period, and this will be starting on July. Um, the deputy prime minister said the Center for Economic Situation Administration, uh, or CESA, will consider a reopening plan approved by business operators on the island, according to the Bangkok Post. The meeting will be chaired by prime minister himself, the prime minister himself, Prayut Chanocha, and the plan could serve as a model for the reopening process for other provinces as well that rely on tourism. Local entrepreneurs and communities have agreed the island province could reopen to foreign tourists, according to uh, the minister, who is also the energy minister. Uh, they said that these entrepreneurs and communities are confident that Phuket's tourism infrastructure is still able to accommodate quality visitors. Previously, provincial authorities and the local private sector came up with a reopening plan known as the Phuket Tourism Sandbox that will allow inoculated foreign tourists to visit the province from July 1, brought forward from the original planned October 1. Now, the governor of the Tourism Authority of Thailand, Yutasak Supasorn, previously said the reopening plan will depend largely on vaccine allocation to the Andaman Sea Island. He said herd immunity must be achieved by inoculating 70% of the population before foreign visitors are allowed in by the reopening date. The plan is said to include a vaccination proposal complete with the number of doses needed and an inoculation timeline suitable for a safe reopening of the tourist island. Now, under the plan also, tourists who want to join the proposed quarantine-free program are required to show a vaccine certificate, vaccine passport, or International Air Transport Association, or IATA, travel pass. However, foreign tourists are still required to take a PCR test at the airport and activate the Thailand Plus tracing app while in the island. Now, um... Meanwhile, in their vaccination plan, the government plans to distribute 800,000 doses of China's Sinovac vaccine, which will arrive in the in 22 provinces in the kingdom by April. Increasing digital fraud attempts against businesses and consumers in the Philippines was observed during the coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 pandemic. According to the Global Consumer Pulse study of Global Informatory, Information and Insights Company TransUnion. The study was based on intelligence from billions of transactions and over 40,000 websites and apps from TransUnion through validated EM and flagship identity proofing risk-based authentication and fraud analytic solution suit. In its Global Consumer Pulse study, 44% of Philippine-based consumers have been targeted by digital fraud in the last three months. It said Salcedo in Eastern Samar, Makati City, and Manila were the top three areas with the highest share of suspected fraudulent digital transactions. Online fraud attempts were mostly targeted to Gen Z or those born between 1995 and 2002 at 48%, followed by millennials or born between 1980 and 1994 at 40, 42%. In terms of digital fraud attempts against enterprises, TransUnion has seen a 31% increase in attacks this year from pre-pandemic level in March 11, 2019 to March 10, 2020 during the COVID-19. Suspected digital fraud attempts in the country were high in sectors of telecommunications, logistics, and financial services, the study indicated. In other news, all Vietnam Airline employees would now be vaccinated against COVID-19 for free. That according to a representative of the national carrier. 
The airline is conducting talks with the Ministry of Health and relevant entities to buy COVID-19 vaccines for all of its employees and their families as soon as possible. Vietnam News Agency cited the representative as saying this. Only the health ministry reserves the right to collaborate with relevant authorities to buy, import, receive, sponsor, and administer COVID-19 vaccines according to a governmental resolution. If Vietnam Airlines were to secure the jabs, it would also need to be distributed by the ministry itself. The vaccines would be provided for free to employees of Vietnam Airlines Group, which includes Vietnam Airlines, Pacific Airlines, and Vasco. Their family members would be supported regarding procedures to get vaccine jabs at the same time. Since airline staff stand a higher chance of contracting the virus, the decision would help protect them and their customers, allowing for peace of mind on the job, according to the representative. With over 22,000 employees, the national carrier expects to receive hundreds of thousands of COVID-19 vaccine shots. The COVID-19 pandemic has reversed development against 4 millions in poor countries, creating an even more sharply unequal world, according to the new UN report released on Thursday. According to the Financing for Sustainable Development Report 2021, issued by the Interagency Task Force on Financing, the global economy has experienced the worst recession in 90 years, with the most vulnerable segments of societies disproportionately affected, pointing out that some 114 million jobs have been lost and about 120 million people have been flung back into extreme poverty. The message of the report is clear and it's stark. COVID-19 is the leading, uh, uh, sharply bifurcated world, leaving hundreds of millions of people behind and putting the development agenda seriously at risk without immediate action on financing for development. The pandemic has caused the worst recession in 90 years and disproportionately affected the most vulnerable segments of our societies, including women and youth. We're seeing between 119 and 124 million people estimated to be the newly pushed into extreme poverty. And the world has lost the equivalent of 255 million full-time jobs. Today's new report puts forward important recommendations. It calls on governments to invest in people, social protection, sustainable infrastructure, and green jobs. It also calls on the international community to support the poorest and most vulnerable countries with debt relief and other measures to ensure liquidity, including the allocation of additional special drawing rights. Before COVID-19, United Nations is have... strongly committed to helping ensure that all our countries can emerge on equal footing for of at least developed and other low-income countries were under threat of or already experiencing debt distress, coupled with fall ta falling tax revenues that has subsequently sent debt levels soaring. In the world's poorest countries, the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, could be, po could be pushed back another 10 years, warns the report. The report says that immediate action is needed to address widening inequalities, rebuild better, and prevent the development reversal. The combat corporate tax avoiding and reduce harmful tax competition, the report underscored the need for a global solution on taxing the digital economy along with better technology to combat illicit financial flaws and to reduce the over-mighty market power of the digital tech giants, it suggests a review of a regulatory framework such as antitrust regulations. Additionally, to reflect the reality of a changing global economy, including an increasingly digi digitalized world, labor market and fiscal policies must be modernized. The report also advocated for a global reporting framework to hold companies accountable for their social and environmental impact and incorporate climate risk into financial regulation.
On the last day of the session before the Catholic uh, Holy Week recess, the Senate on Monday approved the franchises of Dito Telecommunity Corp., another telecommunications company and four broadcast firms. Take a look. Senator Grace Paul, the chairperson of the Committee on Public Services, steered the passage of the measures. The franchise of Dito Telecommunity Corp. got the approval of 17 senators, with Senators Riza Ontiveros and Francis Pangilinan voting against it and Senator Panfilo Lacson abstaining. Previously, the telecommunications sector was being dominated by Smart Philippine Long Distance Company and Globe Telecom. Poe said the entry of Dito Telecommunity as a new major player in the Philippine telecommunications market would spur the competition for more affordable and better internet and mobile services available to more Filipinos. House Bill 7332 seeks to renew Dito's franchise for another 25 years. Dito holds a congressional franchise via Mindanao Islamic Telephone Company Incorporated which is set to expire in Innovation, digital disruption, globalization. Startups, micro, small, and medium enterprises, as well as large corporations, all face interesting challenges in the market today. Peek into the world of exciting opportunities and partnerships to drive growth with the latest business news and information. We are open for business. Your weekly dose of entrepreneurial inspiration to update you on the latest developments in the world of business. Get up close and personal with CEOs and thought leaders to help you discover valuable insights. Sharpen your instincts for smart decision making with the latest markets and economic trends. Disruptive ideas, global innovation, social entrepreneurship and other leading-edge business ideas. Join the conversations to create a more vibrant environment for entrepreneurship. Catch Open for Business from Vision to Action. You know how to carry yourself. Alam mo na yung image. Alam mo na yung uh, uh, kung paano mo dalhin yung sarili mo. I just listened to a much improved singer. Congratulations! Dahil pasok ka din sa semifinals, Purple Heart! Ang pangarap kong di susukuan, makarating sa dulo ng laban. Ako po si Purple Heart, ang panlaban ng Quezon City. Wow, ibaka, ibaka. Pag kumakanta siya, nakangiti lagi. Araw ang 
has been made on the status of the LPGA Blue Bay Tournament planned for China in May, LPGA officials said Wednesday while confirming Singapore and Thailand events. While tweaking the U.S. schedule to erase to ease travel to Asia for two other events, the LPGA said in a statement the fate of the LPGA event on China's Hainan Island, planned for May 13 to 16, will be announced in the coming weeks as the LPGA continues to fully assess the situation with its partners in China. The HSBC Women's World Championship will be played April 29 to May 2 at Singapore's Sentosa Golf Club while the Honda LPGA Thailand will be staged May 6 to 9 at Siam Country Club in Chonburi. Both events were wiped out in 2020 by the COVID-19 pandemic and will be conducted under strict health protocols with Park Sung Yoon of South Korea defending her title in Singapore and South Korean Ami Yang defending her crown in Thailand. We are incredibly appreciative for our global partners who are going above and beyond to ensure playing opportunities for our athletes, LPGA Chief Tournament Business Officer Ricky Lasky said. The LPGA Lost Championship remains set for April 14-17 to 17 with a Saturday finish of Kapolei Hawaii Golf Club with the LPGA Los Angeles open shifting a day earlier to also have a Saturday finish. On April 24th at Wilshire's Country Club to ease trouble issues for Asia-bound players. Work on Indonesia's first football stadium with a retractable roof is still buzzing despite the pandemic and monsoon rains. Built on 21 hectares of land near the city sport, the world-class Jakarta International Stadium is half done and on schedule to be completed by the end of the year with room for some 82,000 spectators. Now that would make it the biggest retractable roof stadium in Asia. That is according to the to Arnold Kindangen from the stadium's developer, Jakarta Proper Tindo. Take a look. Ini adalah stadion kita yang pertama berstandar FIFA dengan rumput hybrid dan diaplikasikan dengan atap buka tutup sehingga uh, stadion ini menjadi stadion multifungsi, multi event tidak hanya untuk menggelar uh, pagelaran sepak bola saja, tapi ini juga bisa menggelar konser-konser internasional. Karena atap kita sudah disupport dengan akustik yang baik. Ya, bisa, uh, sangat berguna juga ya ketika memang di Indonesia sendiri kan cuaca cukup uh, ekstrim ya. Ketika memang musim hujan itu sangat uh, tinggi uh, curah hujannya. Sehingga ketika atap ini bisa ditutup, pertandingan masih bisa uh, diselenggarakan. Built on 21 hectares of fifth or 52 acres of land near the city's port, the world-class Jakarta International Stadium is half done 
and on schedule to be completed by the end of the year with room, as earlier mentioned, for some 82,000 spectators. That would make it the biggest retractable roof stadium in Asia. The new facility, slated to be some 73 meters high, will feature a 360-degree sky view deck on its top floor, giving spectators a clear view of the Mega City and Java Sea. Its design will be similar to English Premier League Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and Bayern Munich's Alliance Arena, according to construction manager Risky Fauzi, who added that the retractable roof is particularly useful given the weather in Indonesia, which can sometimes be extreme during the rainy season. The new stadium is set to host top-tier Indonesian club Persija Jakarta for football, Indonesia's most popular sport, as well as music concerts. Let's get the latest developments in Myanmar. Joining us live is Crystal Mapa. Hello, Crystal. Hello, Steffi. Yes, this is the latest news in Myanmar. A fire from a hurled Molotov cocktail broke out early Friday at the party headquarters of the post civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar's largest city, a party official said. The country has been in uproar since the military ousted the Nobel laureate in a lightning putsch on February 1, triggering an uprising demanding a return to democracy. Her party, the National League for Democracy, or NLD, has been in this array since the coup with some of its elected MPs in hiding. At about 4 a.m. Friday, an attacker hurled a Molotov cocktail at its Yangon headquarters, causing a brief fire. The official said only the entrance of the office was scorched and party members were already inside assessing the damage. And I quote, we have to file a complaint to the police. We do not know who did this, but it's not good at all. So we instead declining to speculate the reason for the attack. The incident comes on the eve of Armed Forces Day when the military will put on a show of strength and its annual parade. Fears have been swirling that the day would could come be, could become a flashpoint. As you may remember, protesters in Myanmar also called for a silent strike on Wednesday. Businesses were asked to close and residents to stay indoors. According to Reuters, the nationwide strike is in response to the death of a seven-year-old girl shot and killed by security forces as she was in her home on Tuesday. The, the, AFP, a the AAPP, a local advocacy group and local media in Myanmar now, said that the girl was in her father's arm when security forces kicked the door down. They then asked if all the family was present. The father said yes, according to the older sister, and the security forces said they didn't believe him. Shot at him and hit the seven-year-old girl and she was killed. Many of the Save the Children and Other Children's advocacy groups calling for a stop to this violence, in particular against minors. Meanwhile, the U.S. and Britain announced sanctions against a huge military-owned conglomerate in Myanmar Thursday as security forces continued to launch brutal crackdowns against anti-coup protesters. International condemnation has so far done little to quell the brutal crackdown. But the United States and Britain said Thursday it would impose sanctions against the highly secretive behemoth Myanmar Economic Holdings, which gives army chiefs access to enormous wealth. Washington announced it was also imposing sanctions on Myanmar Economic Corporation Limited. A U.S. Treasury Department statement said the Myanmar military controls significant segments of the country's econo economy through this holding firms. In another development, staff, regional powers Indonesia and Singapore on Thursday urged the junta to halt its use of lethal arms as their foreign ministers met to discuss Myanmar. Singapore's Vivian Balakrishnan said both nations were distressed by the loss of human lives, but said the solution would have to come from within. Back to you, Steph. Thank you so much, Christelle, for, for your update. You stay safe there. Thanks. 
Beth, reporting live from Thailand. This is Crystal Mapa. We live in interesting times. And uh, around 1,500 medical workers and COVID-19 patients, many in full PPE, joined for a mass performance of the Angklung, a traditional Indonesian instrument made of bamboo. The act marks the opening of the country's largest COVID-19 hospital, which has treated more than 70,000 patients. Yeah. Boleh kalau mau sambil. Thank you, Steph, for uh, keeping me company today. But before we go, let me just read this out for our program advisory uh, today until uh, the 27th. Now, to help curb the increasing cases of COVID-19 in the Philippines, uh, Net25 will temporarily suspend studio tapings from March 20 to 27. Please expect some changes in our programming. Your favorite entertainment shows like Happy Time, It's Singing Time, and Que Saya Saya will feature their best of the best episodes. And meanwhile, regular news programs and breaking news will continue to keep you informed and updated with the latest developments about the pandemic. For relevant information and other announcements, keep watching Net25. You may also visit at Net25 TV on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks, Steffi. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much, Alma, for having me today. And that is the latest news in the Southeast Asian nations. Uh, this is a stay update about the ASEAN region. This is Steffi Dihuan, uh, your EBC Maldives Bureau, and we live in interesting times. Thank you, Steffi. And, uh, We'll see you back next week. Have a safe weekend, everyone. I'm Alma Angeles, and we live in interesting times. Mapupuno ng saya, impormasyon at inspirasyon ang hapon mo sa Afternoon Power. Handog sa inyo ng Net25. Sasabay sa inyong tangalian ang inyong Happy Time Barkada at 12 noon. Alamin ang mga pangyayari sa ASEAN Nations, ASEAN in Focus at 2 p.m.